Friday night racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you're very welcome along to Friday Night Racing here on Off the Ball, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Check out hri.ie, or of course you can uh, follow the Twitter account at hri racing, and the hashtag is every racing moment. Johnny Ward is with us as ever. Johnny, how are you doing? Not bad, Jerry. It's uh, it's uh, lockdown still going on here, but at least the weather is beautiful and. Uh, you know, uh, getting a little bit used to it. I don't know how you're surviving it. You've uh, obviously kids. Is that a good or a bad thing in the lockdown? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, if you're on your own, you only have yourself to worry about. But I guess maybe having a purpose in life isn't the worst thing for some of us at this moment either. Um, I, I'm delighted to our guest this week is is Robbie Power. Robbie, how are you getting on? Good, job, are you? I'm good. Uh, how how is lockdown for you? Yeah, look, it's um. It's getting pretty boring now. This stage, or doing uh, trying to drag jobs out. Uh, the garden looks immaculate. There's not a blade of grass out of place. But um, just trying to get on with things and, and um, get jobs done. Whatever has to be done, get them done. Um, as somebody who is a, an athlete, do you have to work on your fitness at the moment? Is that are you just parking all that and thinking, you know, a few days back on the um, actual racing circuit will get you back to the level you need to be at? Um, I don't think there's any point at the moment running about fitness. Uh, I haven't been riding out since um, the last day I rode in the race course in Clonmel, which is just over a fortnight ago. So uh, we've no set day to come back yet. So um, I can't see racing starting back, um, jump racing definitely until June time. So uh, until you get a set time as to when you're going to start back, obviously you won't get your fitness go too mad. But um, uh, yeah, there's no real point in worrying too much about it at the moment anyway. Some of the sports are actually just taking this opportunity to, to it's their off season essentially, uh, knowing that they're going to be full back, fully back into it. Not much of an off season when you can't go off and let the body rest on a beach or whatever. But are, are you essentially doing the same thing? You kind of shut down the whole notion of being an athlete at the moment in preparation for when it comes back, going back full tilt. Yeah, basically that's all you can do. You know, um, wait for a for a date when we do get a, a time to go, but. Um, as I said, there's no real point in, in um, worrying about your fitness too much at the moment. And it is good, especially for some of the older lads in the room, including myself, to to let your body um, have a bit of downtime, you know, because uh, there's been plenty of injuries over the years. And I can't remember the last time I had a break. That's, um, well, I suppose this is an enforced break, but the last time I've had a break has been always through injuries. So uh, it's nice to have a, a bit of a break when you are um, physically 100% and let the body unwind um, in its own way. That's the thing, Robbie, as well, isn't it? That people don't um, maybe get about racing, that there isn't any proper break at all. It's literally all year round, pretty much bar Christmas Day. And uh, you have to be injured because you're not going to, even in the summer, you're not going to just go off for two weeks and come back because you know you'll have missed rides and all that. Yeah, exactly. You can't um, bugger off there in the middle of summer. And if you do, you're going to miss out on a few winners and, and plenty of rides. There's a 10-day break at the end of June, which is really... You can't really enjoy either because if you go away and let yourself go for a week, then you've got to kill yourself when you come back to it and you get your weight back down. So uh, I suppose if there is one good thing for, for a jockey to come out of this, it's that you, you give your body a chance to, to let all the, the muscles and, and, and recover properly. Do the jockeys have like kind of WhatsApp? Sorry, Jerry, do the jockeys have like WhatsApp groups where you're chatting away to each other, kind of comparing your lockdown uh, situations at the moment? Uh, a little bit, yeah. There's plenty of Snapchat going on now of lads doing different things behind in their own houses and all that sort of thing, out in their front lawns, making each of themselves. But, uh, yeah, there's um, plenty going on. Are they all sharing the meals that they're allowed to eat now for the couple of weeks, knowing full well that it's actually going to be plenty of time before they're back racing? You can you can basically eat like a pig for a few weeks here. You can, yeah, you can. Um, I'm probably lucky enough. My father always said you can't fatten a thoroughbred, so uh, at the moment <laughs> I haven't put on too much weight anyway. Um, it must be a real concern for some of the jockeys. I'm yeah, sure look, I'm lucky enough my weight is fairly stable, but there are plenty of lads, and especially the flat lads, you know, they're coming into the start of their season as well, and um, it hasn't the season hasn't started yet, and they're hoping to get started in the next few weeks. When that'll happen, I don't know, but they've got to keep a good eye on their weight, because when they do start, they're going to start full tint. Robbie, will you talk to us about your body? Are you, like, you're at a, a stage of your career where... People obviously keep asking you, you know, Jesus, this is a, a, um, an Indian summer you're having where there's been incredible success over the last couple of years. 
at this time of the year, how sore are you having been in, you know, enormously this time last year, say, for example, what, what kind of state was the body in before that 10 day break in June? Yeah, this time last year, it wasn't great. I had um, fractured two vertebrae in my back just before Cheltenham Road through Cheltenham with them, then didn't ride from Cheltenham till um, Ferry House, and then didn't ride from Ferry House to Punchestown because of the vertebrae in my back. But um, luckily enough, it was uh, I got through them the two big weeks, and you put up with it this time of year because you're, you're looking forward to like this is Easter week and we're generally looking forward to Fairy House. So the looking forward to a Boyle Sports Irish Grand National or something like that is um gets you through and then your opponents are starting to follow on a couple of weeks later. But this year it's a bit different. Um you don't have them. So um yeah, look it I'm t- look, this year touch what I, I did a good year um with falls and injuries and things like that there. So the body's in pretty good shape. Um but at the same time still it's still no harm for a ton of rest. How would you reflect on Cheltenham in general? I know you must have been delighted with loss in translation, but maybe it was a, uh, I suppose, a tough enough week for you. Disaster. Um, yeah. in translation. You put it a lot, you put it a lot uh, better than I did. <laughs> yeah, the, the loss in translation was very, very good, and he ran a cracker in the in the Gold Cup, and I still think he's better than that. Um, and I think the way Tizard's horses ran all week, for him to come out and run like he did in the Gold Cup, um, just goes to show what a, what a class horse I think, I think he is. Um, and I definitely it's think interesting you say that. Cup. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because, like, uh, I think a lot of people I spoke to were at that stage of the week. They they weren't. They were just put off back in Tizard horses. Yet he came out and ran as well as he did, considering he also went into the race on the back of a pretty bad prep as well. Yeah, he had an ordinary preparation for the race, and um, for him to run the way he did was was huge credit to the horse. And I definitely think he he has the ability, and I do think he stays the trip. A lot of people said he didn't get up the hill. He's only beaten the length of the quarter. Um, mm. So I don't think that's an issue, and I think with a better run next year, better preparation, I would imagine his campaign. I know it was this year, but things didn't quite go to plan. But next year, everything will be geared towards um, going to the Gold Cup, and he'll definitely go there fresh as well because he's a much better horse when he's fresh. Could you put it down to Anton the Tizard performance that week? Was it just one of them things? Just one of them things. Um, a good few of the horses were reported to be quite sick after Cheltenham. Um, after the runs, they all appeared well. And I went over there the Friday before Chatham to school a few of them. And of all the ones I schooled, I think um, Finn on the Roof actually felt unbelievably well. You know, I was really looking forward to him in the Supreme. Then he came out and ran like he did. Um, but that's animals. They're, 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 they're livestock, they're animals. And um, they can't tell you. They just obviously, if things didn't go right, they picked up some sort of virus in them a few days on the build up to the festival. And, um, it was just unfortunate because they all, if you look back at the road, they actually kind of all ran the same kind of race um, at the top of the hill. They were sort of there with, with a bit of a chance and then by the time they got half down the hill, they were gone. It's remarkable as well, you mentioned Fiddler on the Roof because I, I was speaking to you about him um, at the HRI Awards and obviously a horse that just had so much going for him going into the race and I, I guess you're not losing any faith going forward when he goes chasing and so on. No, definitely not. Um He's going to make it into a lovely chase for next season. I, I'm not going to lose faith in any of the horses um, the way they ran in Cheltenham. They all, and most of them ran too bad, too true, including Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, the big breakaway, again, I think huge credit to him to finish fourth in the in the Neptune was a massive run because he never, at any stage in the race, felt like the horse had ridden them two starts before that. So I know it was a step up in class and all that, but at no stage in the race did he feel like the horse had won on in Newbury or, or Chepstow. So, um I think massive credit to him to finish where he did. So um, looking forward to the three of them lost in translation, fit on the roof and uh, the big breakaway are three exciting horses for next season. Did it affect the boss man the way the week was going? No, in fairness to both Colin and Joe, they, they kind of take these things well, you know, and it's obviously when there's so much hype and build up to a week, it's it's disappointing when it starts off that bad. But as Colin said after the Gold Cup, what would be the disaster of a week is actually finished on a good note. So, um, you always have to take the positives out of this game. If you let it get to you too much, you'd, you'd, you'd never get on it. In a situation like that where a week hasn't gone very well, um, obviously the, the joy of being involved in the sport like racing is you can get back on next week and back into races and you hope the horses come well for the, the very end of the season. That, that's obviously been gone now. Does that mean Cheltenham lingers a bit longer for everybody involved with those horses? Do they, do they carry that disappointment a bit longer? Or again, just that's the nature of the sport, you have to get on with it straight away. I think that depends on the mentality of the person, really. Uh, for me, no, I'd forgotten about Cheltenham when I touched down in Dublin Airport on, on Friday night. Um, when we were kids growing up, if we had a bad 
weekend at a show or something with the ponies. My father would say, forget about what happened that weekend and move on. And when I landed in Dublin Airport, Trenton was forgotten about. I wrote a winner in Navin behind closed doors on the Saturday. And I think I wrote four or five winners in the, in the week after Cheltenham, you know, so on the build-up to the to the shutdown. So, um, yeah, look, you've got to forget about it and move on. Um, as I say, I was racing in Navin that Saturday and, and that horse winning the maiden hurdle could have been, that was his supreme novices, if you know what I mean, for the week here. So, uh, um, it's very important that you move, leave behind you and move on. And were you, were you able to do that when your dad told you that the first time? Because, like, you know, kids notoriously uh, take defeats badly. Were you uh, good at learning how to move on quickly from show jumping? Uh, we had no choice, really. Um, that's the way it was. He said, uh, uh, from a very young age, we were it was drilled into us when we were riding 12 two ponies. So you're under 12 years of age, and it was drilled into us that we, if we had a bad week, we moved on. So you'd be driving out the gate, and we'd be going a mile or two up the road from the show, and you'd say, Daddy, what about that mistake? I've, we're forgetting about that now. You know the mistake you made, and that was it. You move on. So, um, yeah, no, I think... Um, it's it was a great piece of advice to be to be drilled into us at a young age. Um, I think uh, for a lot of reasons, carrying problems with you down the line is, is not good. How would you compare that? I'd say to pony rising or um, an, a, a different type of upbringing for a jockey because yours was obviously quite unique and you know a path that others have trodden as well. I suppose to become a jockey. Yeah, I don't think there's any set way, the right way to. Um, as to oh, as an upbringing to which way is the right way to become a jockey there's pony racing obviously Paul Carberry Barry Garrity will be two prime examples of that I was show jumping um, John Franken show jumped as well he won a European silver medal as well um, Harry Skelton has done a lot of show jumping so there's different routes but I think it's the people behind the person is the most important thing you know like Ruby didn't compete at any major pony racing level he didn't compete at any major show jumping or, or a three day eventing level but he had the right people behind him and his father Ted and his mother Helen and um, that sort of people helped him so he had the right grounding for the sport um, same as I had with my mother and father and same as Paul Carberry and Barry Garrity and, and Harry Skett and everyone I've mentioned they've all had the right grounding behind them the people behind them are, are the most important In terms of presenting a horse to an obstacle is the same thing um, are there things that you learn from both to um, I suppose bestow on the other or did it help you along the way? Uh, I have to learn a lot of it along the way as well you know um, the big difference from show jumping to racing was that obviously the different speeds and how much quicker a fence would come at your racing. But um, I think in general, again, the more you jump, um, the, be the better you become at it, the more practice you get at it. So um, have, having the basics and then learning yourself as you go along. Um, I think the, the most important thing about racing is knowing a horse's, capa horse's capabilities. Um, if you don't know what a horse can and can't do, well, maybe you shouldn't ride that horse, you know. Um, you've, you've got to know what a horse's capabilities are. That's interesting, though. Sometimes there must be a race meeting where you get on a horse quite late and you've you've seen it run before, but maybe you've never actually ridden the horse itself. Like, How quickly can you assess what the horse is capable of and, and how do you do that? Is it is it just watching videos? Is it from talking to other jockeys who might have, or work riders or the trainer? Like, how, how do you acquire that information about a horse that you haven't been on? A bit of both. Um, you'd, you'd watch a video, two or three videos of a horse's race the night before and say to yourself, oh yeah, maybe he can't stand off, have to let him go in short. And the feel a horse would give you on the way to the start as well, the, the length of his stride and all them sort of things would um, be an indication as to what his capacities are. And um, then materialises you, you know what he can and can't do if he's going in short and popping away and do not just having a bit, a bit of issues there with that line we'll get that back in a second I, I just want to well um, we'll come There's back to that with, uh, with Robbie up there. There's also what a good stuff to get into as well um, I just want to tell everybody that the racing industry has come together to support Horse Racing Ireland's online auction to raise money for the Feed the Heroes charity. You might have seen this. It's a great initiative that is actually donating food to people who are working on the front line. You can donate four euros, which is the price of a race card, or you can bid on some great auction items on app.galabid.com forward slash frontline. And it's also been promoted on all of HRI's social media channels as well. So this is the racing industry getting behind the Feed the Heroes charity you can donate four euros. It's the price of a race card, as I said, or you can bid on some great auction items. App.galabid.com forward slash frontline. And I think we can all agree that is a, a great cause to be getting behind. Uh, a reminder too, 
The Tote Irish Inter Jockeys Fund now stands at 840 euros as it receives a boost of 100 euros in place for a usual weekly bet on Irish racing. The international racing of note for Tote customers this weekend comes from Australia with four Group 1s on the card this Saturday at Randwick. You can bet on and live stream the action on the tote.com. This is Friday Night Racing brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie or follow the new Twitter account at HRI Racing. And the hashtag is every racing moment. We've got uh, Robbie Power on the line this week. Johnny Ward is obviously with us as well. Robbie, you were just talking there about the, the work that goes into getting on a horse that you don't know. I'm, I'm interested in hearing the, the talk about the pathways in. At what point did you decide that you actually wanted to be a jockey as opposed to a, a full-time show jumper or somebody working in the show jumping arena? Uh, it was quite late on. Um, I went to the European Young Rider Championships in, in Harpy in England in 2000. Uh, I was 20. Uh, and that was in August of that year. And then in, uh, I think it was in um, in 2000 and won it all my first winner in December 2001 so literally a year after that I thought financially it was going to be very very difficult where I get the back end to be a, an international show jumper and I didn't want to do it at, a, at an ordinary level so um, I couldn't see where I was going to get the back end so I um, I wanted to come home I was based in England and wanted to come home and, and try something different and um, I always thought I, but my father's six foot two and, and that there I always thought it'd be too big and heavy to be a jockey but um it was my first love. I always wanted to be a jockey. And um, when I stood in the scales when I came home, I was 10 and a half stone. And I thought, well, I'd easily lose half a stone. And uh, I might give this a go. So that's how I decided. Well, I was late to start um, race riding compared to most other people who started 16. I was 20, rising 21 when I started. You kind of answered that question that? maybe for me. But sorry, Jerry, you, you kind of answered the question, Robbie. But how does it compare financially? What are the you know, T's and C's of becoming a, a top-class show jumping rider uh, and do you need to be at a really elite level to make it pay ultimately? Yeah, you do. Look, I think the, a lot of the finances in uh, in show jumping are buying and selling young horses and find a nice horse, bringing them along, producing them and then selling them on. Um, so there's very few riders, especially ones based in Ireland, that get to ride at the at five-star international level. So, uh, I wanted to ride at five star international level the whole time, and that would have meant to be based probably in, in Europe or definitely in England anyway. And uh, then when you get them good horses, it's finding someone to keep them for you. So um, it's a bit like the a little bit like the smaller national hunt yards when they get a real good grade one horse, Kingstown, JP, Rich Richie, the big owners are banging on the door trying to get someone to buy them. Mm -hmm. When you started at uh, 20, Rising 21, did, did you feel the, the difference between you and the lads who had the four or five years of, of coming through as an apprentice? Because obviously that was how the industry expected people to come through. This was a, not notwithstanding you mentioned John Frank and earlier on, that um, you know, it was a relatively unusual pathway. So one, you have to have determination. I'm sure that certainly, and the moxie to go and do it, that, that must have been very attractive to anybody putting on their horses. But other people would have been like, well, you know, I've got a jockey the same age who's actually... You know, has ridden fifteen hundred times in the meantime while you've been show jumping. Did you personally feel that there was a gap there that you needed to close quite quickly? Um, so I never felt it, but there probably was. I think um, at the time I was riding out for Jessica Harrington and, and Paddy Mullins, and um, they both had great confidence in me. That I had um, was lucky with my show jumping background that I had um, good experience in, in presenting ours to a jump. But I had to develop a racing brain. Uh, I had no experience from pony racing of how to ride a race um, or any of them things. So I had to try and develop a, a racing brain and, how, and learn how to ride a race. And I had to learn that fairly quick because um, there wasn't much time. As you say, there's lads who had probably 1,000 rides or 500 rides that, under their belt that I had none. So um, I had to develop that. And, and back in them days as well, was, which was a great help for me, there was a lot of um, schooling races. So I got to ride and probably seven or eight rides, six or seven rides every day at school and races uh, for Jesse, Paddy and whoever else wanted to put me up in a school and race. So uh, they were a big advantage to me back in them days. Again, just thinking about it, now, if you were coming through that pathway, you'd be able to watch millions and millions of hours of videos. It probably wasn't that easy to get your hands on exactly uh, every single horse that you were going to be on, every race that they'd been in. So uh, how do you become a race rider? How do you learn what it is to actually we talked to Ruby about this one time before and he talked about his internal clock and, and everybody talks about his ability to present horses at the right moment um, in terms of like 
uh, getting them ready to to compete at the end of the race. How do you develop that when you haven't had all of that from under eights the whole way through? Well, I suppose it, there's no there's no substitute for that uh, than experience. And the more you ride, the better you become at it. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are naturally born riders. Um, Paul Carvey is probably the most naturally talented rider I ever rode against. Um, but you have to learn or to ride a race uh, and that's only something that comes with um, with practice you know same as anything else uh, in any sport your match play is, is key and, and that's the most important thing and the more you ride in races the better equipped and, and the more confident you become to deal with, with different issues you know if your plan is to jump out handy in a race and after going two furlongs you realise your horse is not able to go this fast it's having the brains to say right don't push him out of his comfort zone because um, the winning post is always at the end of the race, so uh, it's having enough horse on to finish the race out to the best of his ability. So, there, there are little things yet. The more you ride, um, the more confidence you get, the more you learn these things. You mentioned Carberry there. You obviously are part of a golden generation. Um, we had Richard Dunwoody on last week, and who was your kind of idol growing up, or uh, was there anyone you, your style mimicked in any way? Because I know obviously a lot of people would say Carberry was the best, and um, was Dunwoody one of your heroes growing up? Yeah, when I was when I was very young, uh, Richard Dunwoody was the one I jumped onto the the armchair of a sofa and bent the dust out of the sofa. I was always wanted to be Richard Dunwoody. He was my hero um, as a kid growing up. And probably one of the, my regrets is that when I uh, that I didn't ride at sixteen or seventeen was that I didn't get to ride against Richard Dunwoody. Um, if I had rode when I could have first got a license out at sixteen, I would have been able to ride against Dunwoody. Um, and that's probably the only regret I have that I didn't get a license out a bit, a bit younger. Um, but I've ridden against some phenomenal, phenomenal jockeys. Um, Ruby, as we talked about, but back the days, Charlie Swan had a, had a phenomenal race in Brain. He was unbelievably good. And Carby as well, Barry Garrity, Adrian Maguire. My first world winner as a professional, I beat Adrian Maguire half the length, uh, which was that was a great buzz. And yeah, as you say, I've been very lucky to ride against some very, very good jockeys. Um, but um, yeah, Carby, when, when we all started race riding, when I started riding out, I ro- tried to ride with my knees an inch above the horse's wither and my arse copped in the air, but um, <laughs> soon realised there was only one Paul Carby and I wasn't going to be able to copy him. <laughs> Who was the best? Um, different ways. Um, so many of them were so good in so many different ways, but I think probably the one that ticked all the boxes was is Ruby. I think Ruby ticked every box. You know, He was, he was the one that brought race riding to a new level. Did you see the way he finished off and it was such a contrast to Richard Dunwoody and that Ruby um, timed us to his own perfection, I suppose, on the racetrack. He did exactly that with Kenboy last year, but Richard Dunwoody wasn't like that at all. And for a lot of people, they don't have that comfort. Um, is it something you worry about when inevitably it happens? No, I think um, look, that's the luxury we'd all like to have is to retire the way Ruby does, has did it. Uh, that would be ideal. Um, but not everybody is, either has the the strength and depth that Ruby had. Uh, Ruby knew that week going into Punches Town that this was going to be his last week. Um, he said afterwards, I think if he'd have won the Grand Master in entry, he would have bowed out on that one. But he had gone into that week, um, I can't remember what rides he had every day, that he'd have fancied, he'd been, I think, in the champion mm. chase the first day. Then he had Kenway in the Gold Cup. He'd had something else in the stairs hurdle on the Thursday. And he always had the, the backup of um, Benny the Doom was going to get him out of a grade one winner on the Saturday. So if everything went pear shaped from from Tuesday through to Friday, Benny the Doom was probably going to get him out on a Grade One winner on the Saturday. So not everyone has that strength and depth and can afford to go out that way. But um, yeah, look to go out in your own terms, to go out in one piece is is the way every jockey wants to retire, and to go out in the winner will be will be fantastic. Do you feel any better or worse now than when you were saying your late twenties? Um, no, I think I feel I. Definitely don't feel any worse anyway. <laughs> mm. um, no, I feel I feel a lot wiser. I've learned an awful lot more over them years, and um, I think that's once I can keep the body in, in good shape and stay in one piece. I think that's the most important thing, and um, keep riding for as long as I can. It was Harry Rogers always said to me, he says, "Ride for as long as you can, because when you stop riding, that's start working." Yeah. Richard Dunwoody actually is funny enough isn't involved in the sport of, of racing anymore he was a pundit for a few years and then he kind of drifted away from that whenever whoever it was that he was working for lost the rights and now he lives in Spain and seems completely isolated from the game itself 
can you envisage a future like that or will you actually always be involved in racing now that you've you've kind of had that bug from the time when you were a kid and jumping on the couch yeah no I'd, I'd like to stay involved in the game in some way when I do retire um, it's racing's been very good to me and I'd love to stay involved in the game but I'd have to have an interest to go racing I don't think I'd go racing just on a day to day basis just for the fun of it I'd have to have an interest or, or a reason to go racing um, but I would definitely like to stay involved in, in racing, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what else I'd do, you know, that's, I'd hopefully in my 40s when I do retire, so um, it's been racing in my life for over 20 years, and I don't know what I'd do outside of, of racing, so I'd love to be staying involved in the game in some way anyway. Are you dipping your toe into that already? Have you always been doing a little bit of that, and, and what kind of role would you see yourself having? Like, could you be a trainer? Could, could Is that something you could see yourself getting into? No, I definitely won't go training. Uh, I, I it's mad the amount of people they say, yeah, I might consider it, and the amount of people like you say, no, no, definitely not. No, and I've had this discussion a few times with people. I think nowadays um, training is a young man's game. And years and years ago, when I started race riding, if you rode, when I started, if I was going to ride for 15 years, I would have been delighted because when I started, jockeys were riding until they were 34 or 5, if they were lucky. Um, but with the help of um, the medical staff now and everything, Life for a jockey is so much different. Jockeys take much more care of themselves. Um, they're much more aware of the, the problems that are out there and, and the injuries are better treated nowadays. So the life expectancy of a jockey now is a lot longer. Um, Ruby rode until leave his 40th birthday. Um, Paul Carby rode into his 40s. Barry's in his 40s. Richard Johnson. The list goes on. You know, A lot of jockeys riding into their 40s now over jumps, which when I started was unheard of. Uh, there was the odd exception, but very, very few. And... You look at all the top trainers nowadays. Gordon Elliott started in his 20s. Um, Joseph O'Brien, Dan Skelton in England, um, Ollie Murphy. All the top trainers coming up now are all, all young lads, you know. And um, if I was to start training, in my, if I was 44 or 5 and I started training, um, you're going to be training against the likes of Joseph O'Brien and them who are younger than you and still have 10 or 15 years training under their belt. That's very interesting, Robbie. I haven't really necessarily heard that before. You can nearly see parallels with younger football managers, but probably haven't heard much about the fact that the uh, the life expectancy, as you put it, of a jockey, that maybe you are just uh, kind of treating yourselves better and you know the, the do's and the do-nots and that I always thought if you're riding into your 40s, you're probably too old, but... I suppose you obviously think that there is... It, it, the jockey starting off now could ride well into his 40s. Of course he could, yeah, once he maintains himself the way the jockeys are doing it now and looking after their bodies the way the jockeys are now it's so much easier now compared to when I started um, how jockeys look after themselves you're much more aware of, of how to look after your body uh, compared to when I started so if you do the job right you can ride for, for an awful long time and um, as I say I, I hope to continue well into my 40s I'm 38 now and uh, I'd love to continue into my 40s but as you say then again it's, it's national racing and you don't know what the next day holds, but um, you'd love, I'd love to continue. As long as my body's able, I'll keep going. And are you diet and strength and conditioning obsessed? Like, is that something that over the last number of years you're like, okay, if I do want to get to that point, then I'm going to have to make sure that every single morsel of food, I know exactly what's in it, and I need to do this amount of uh, stretches and this amount of um, warm-ups and cool-downs. And, like, are you obsessed about that kind of stuff, or is it like, look, I'm going to take my body as far as it, as it gives me? that's exactly the way it is. I take my body as far as it gives me. I know I have to do a lot more exercises now with my back um, and things like that from the Indies I've had over the last few years. Um, and I've been up in Santry with Ender King a good few times and, and all these things are, are massive helps. Once I stay in the swimming pool and stay doing these stretches, um, that's all my body needs. I don't need any more. My diet is, is very stable. My weight is very stable. I, I haven't done below 10 stone 3 for... I'd say probably nine or ten years, and I think my body's felt the benefit of that because I'm not in saunas the whole time. Uh, and I could do a lot lighter than 10 stone three, but I don't. Um, I, I want to say I could do a lot lighter. I could maybe do 10 stone one for a, an Irish Grand National or an English National if I wanted to, but I don't. Um, I've that discipline now that I won't go below 10 stone three, and I think my body um, has reaped the rewards of that because I'm not in saunas. Uh, I can't remember the last time I got a sauna. Uh, I've had a hot bath, I'd say, twice this year to lose a pound, but that's about it. Is that advice you give to younger jockeys? Oh, definitely, yeah. The less time you spend in saunas, the much more likely your weight is to become stable. Uh, because when you're in a sauna sweating or a hot bath sweating, 
Uh, you're only taking fluids out. As soon as you take them out for the water, you're putting that fluid back on. And if you lose two, you're guaranteed to put four back on. So um, mm. I've been through all that. I've done it all. Um, and my weight, I often rode a 10 stone two or 10 stone three on a Sunday. And Monday morning, it could be 10, 12. Uh, did, your, so did, did you improve, actually, so it's going to give up, giving that up, more or less? Um, probably, yeah. I think because mentally you were, you, were, you weren't having to worry about losing weight. Um, definitely does help. When, you're, when weight's not an issue for you, it definitely does help. And uh, if, you, if you can manage to stay out of saunas um, and off hot baths and get a stable diet and a stable weight, it, it's a huge advantage to you going forward because that's one thing off your mind. It's enough to worry about when you're worried about what horses to ride and how to ride them and all them sort of things uh, without having to worry about your weight as well. Forgive my ignorance here, but if you are saying that you're only going to, um, if, if that's going to be your way to 10 stone three, does that mean there are times when people ring you up and, and would like to book you for a ride and you're like, I'm not going to be able to make that weight, so I can't take that ride? Yeah, yeah. There are times when I've been asked to do below 10 stone three and I, I couldn't do the weight. Uh, I'd say, no, I can't do that weight. Um, if the horse had 10 two or 10 one, I'd say, I'll do 10 three of it, which would be pound or two pound overweight. Uh, I won a valuable mare's handicap hurdle. Um, the first run of the Dublin Racing Festival on a mare at Jessie's. Uh, she had 10 stone one, and Jessie said, just do 10 three, and I should be fine. Uh, and she won. So um, that's it. I've set this, the ball out now. 10 stone three is my bottom weight, and, and that's the way it's been for the last definitely eight years, anyway. I do find it so, in, intriguing. I think, is, I think, um, sorry, Jared, that I just, it's, it's, some, it's something of an outlier racing that if you, if you play football or if you play hurling or if you're a gymnast or if you're whatever, a rugby player, you have to be produced in absolute peak shape to suit that day's, that performance. Yet in racing, some jockeys will go out there basically wasted, having not eaten, and still think they can perform to 100%. And it never made sense to me in that you're, you're not preparing yourself properly for the race because you, you, even if it's only five minutes long, how can you perform to your peak level awesome. if you've wasted yourself? There's two ways of looking at it. I suppose there's your way of looking at that, that you've wasted so much. But I always was the, the mentality that if I've gone through this much torture to lose this much weight, I'm not doing it for nothing. Yeah. And I think a lot of jockeys are through that mentality as well one they're doing it because they think it's worth the while um, and it's only for a short period of time I don't think I ever got bet, bet on the horse because I was uh, I was dehydrated or I was um, wrecked from waste I don't think that ever happened to me um, but I think because I raised my weight a couple of pounds I think my body has felt uh, the benefit of it in, in the long term mm. My question was going to be, you obviously you have to reach a stage in your career where you're confident enough to be able to say to big trainers, no, I'm not doing I'm not doing 10 stone one or I'm not doing 10 stone, I'm not doing that horse for you. Like you needed to have the, the success behind you and the self-confidence, but also to know that it was the right thing. Were they difficult conversations the first time you made that, that call or did everybody just go, fair enough, I, I respect your, your decision to do it? Um, I think most trainers accept when you, when you tell them you can't do a weight, they accept that um, once they don't see you doing that weight a week later because you fancied the horse a week later when you fancied their horse. Um, I think when you set yourself a, a weight, that's it. Um, you, you don't go below it for, for no circumstances. Um, I missed a, a winner last year at the Dublin Racing Festival on, uh, on Whisper in the Breeze. He was a 100 gram handicap and he 10 stone one. Um, and Jesse wanted him to carry 10 stone one, so Paddy Kennedy rode him um, and I sat it out. But that's that's the way it is you know um, you can't do the way so so don't take the ride is the, is the old saying I also suppose that you probably were happier to sue these rides because you have ridden a lot of grade one horses over the last two or three years and did that change your mindset towards um, you know lesser rides and handicaps or whatever it is wasting away because you knew you're you're, you're never far away from a good grade one ride the last few years yeah but I made this decision long before I ever had good grade one horses to ride um, so I just for me, I just thought I couldn't keep going and losing weight and, and doing all that. Now, there's a lot of lads do it every day, day in, day out. They're losing weight. Joseph O'Brien was doing it. Davy Russell does it a lot at the moment. He's always having battles with his weight. Andrew McNamara, when he was riding, was another one. Donica. Um, there's lots of lads get up. John Cullen, when he was riding, lots of lads get up. They have to lose um, um, weight every day. So um, that's just the way it is. Can I ask you about the that point we made earlier on about um, jockeys riding into... Uh, their late 30s and early 40s. The benefit of that seems to be, famously, AC Milan had the Maldini project, um, Munster also took it, where they've they've put an increased value on experience. It was the only thing, as you said, money can't buy. 
you can buy the best players in the world for whatever sport it is and you put them all together, but you can't cheat the level of experience. Is that why we're seeing more and more riders who are older winning? Is it a simple thing that you just become a better rider the more you ride? Yeah, I definitely think that's, uh, as you said, you, uh, you can't be experienced. So um, I think uh, definitely the, the more you ride and um, the longer you ride, provided your career, career has gone the right way, then yeah, definitely um, there's an old head and uh, young shoulders the same. Well, in racing, it's, a, it's an old head and old shoulders. You need to be, um, you need to have plenty of experience on the belt. There's a lot of lads riding good lads riding like Jack Kennedy for example is, is an old head on young shoulders um, so he's gained plenty of experience and he, he will be he is a very very good rider and, and has the ability to be champion jockey someday you know he's a top top class rider We had Barry Gardy on a couple of weeks ago and he was even talking about how three years ago he made a mistake in a race at Cheltenham that he rectified two years ago and he used the same strategy this year and obviously he's one of the best riders that um, this country has ever produced but he's still learning and he's still getting to the point where he's analysing things and, and he feels he's becoming a, a better jockey. Do you feel you've still got a way to go that you haven't actually reached your peak yet? Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether... I don't think you, you ever like to think you've reached your peak as a jockey. You always believe there's there's better days ahead. Um, and I'd like to think hope think and hope there are still better days ahead. Um, but as you say, it's it's them experiences where you know you made a mistake in Cheltenham or wherever it may be and and learning from it that um, down the line you can um, recall that experience again you know that, and them things are invaluable Robbie you've obviously told us the story of um, your eye injury uh, on the, the show before how, how is the eye now is it is it totally fine does it bother you in day to day life at all no, not in day-to-day -day life. It, it never did. In, in day-to-day -day life, it never did. Um, it is improving as, as time goes by. I still ride with the lens and the goggles, and, and that will always be the case. Um, but, yeah, no, in, in, as I say, in day-to-day -day life, it, it doesn't affect me at all. And uh, Thankfully, I have that lens in my goggle that um, a lot of people maintain. I should have put it in my goggles years ago, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's working great. And um, as I say, I'll, never, um, I'll always ride with the lens and the goggle and but right now at home now I don't use the, the goggles um, I don't need to uh, it's just when you get in the adrenaline of a race and, and everything builds up that you can, I can get double vision I pulled the goggles down one day last year um, going to the second last in Exeter just because the goggles were getting very fogged up and I thought oh maybe I'll see what the double vision is like And but I did pull the goggles down I still had it so um, no I'll stick with the goggles now for the rest of my career you know? did the horse win? he did <laughs> it, did, it didn't matter though at that stage whether I had goggles or not I was <laughs> that, was, that was important all right um, when when an incident like that happens in your career and there is a, a risk that your career is going to be over does that make everything afterwards Does that is that a, an awakening for you that this is like every race now really matters and not that it doesn't because you know jockeys obviously are followed around by an ambulance every day they go to work so I presume there's a, a, a sense of wokeness anyway but when something like that happens does it change your perspective um, a little bit, yeah, a little bit, I suppose, you, you realise how lucky you are to be back. I think that was the biggest worry with, with that injury was that we couldn't find the problem and I had been to two or three different doctors before we actually found out what the problem was. So it was the uncertainty of whether I'd be able to ride again or not was, was the problem. But um, yeah, it was when we found that the, the goggle that worked and the lens that worked in the goggle and I was able to ride again, that was relief that I was back and I was I was very very relieved to, to be back race riding so um that was a huge boost and then for what happened for happened that year to fuck as the year prevailed after was was unbelievable so um it was just lucky to be back you know and it, that could have been so much worse and you might never have been back you know yeah what are sure. your uh, horses you're looking forward to for Jessica kind of um any of her flat horses take your eye as well I know the the flat is hopefully not too far away yeah, I know that um, both Jesse and, and all the team down there, Shane Foley especially, they're all praying that these guineas and Oaks and all this especially um, get the go ahead because uh, she had a fantastic bunch of two-year-old fillies last year and um, fingers crossed um, the Irish English Oaks and all these things and, and, and guineas get the go ahead because um, I think Jesse can add another classic to her CV this year with the, with the bunch of fillies she's got. She's got a really nice bunch of fillies. 
I had one last question for you. It's obviously uh, Easter weekend. We're supposed to be looking forward to the Boys Sports Irish Grand National. Uh, reading your column, you were kind of suggesting that maybe that is a traditional day for it in the calendar and that maybe the best thing to do is to roll it over to next year. There's some talk that there might be some room for it in the calendar later on in the year. What's your take here? Um, I don't think there's any room for the Irish Grand National in the autumn or, or early winter. It's... Um, since 1990, when I went to Ferry House to watch Desert Orchid win the Irish Grand National, I've been going to it as a spectator or a, a jockey ever since. And it is run on Easter Monday without exception. And, and that's the way it should stay, you know. It's bitterly disappointing for everybody that we've lost the Irish Grand National this year. It would have been the 150th run of it. Um, and there's no one more disappointed than Ferry House, the local people around County Mead. Um, and by the sports who sponsor, everyone's hugely disappointed to lose the race. But um, it's the old saying, it's gone, let it go. So um, have it back next year on Easter Monday and, the, and the, have the 150th running of the, the Irish Grand National in, in um, Ferry House 2021 on Easter Monday, where it should be. The, there's a, bit, a busy calendar in the autumn of the year and early winter. Um, there's talk of they might put it on the weekend when the bar won race and Hatton's Grace, Trimmore. The Irish Grand National is a feature race in itself. It doesn't need to fit in with um, with other races. There's a three mile five chase on that day called the Porterstown Chase, which locally is a quite prestigious race to win anyway. So if HRI and them feel that they want to have a big money race, another big money race in, in early um, winter, have put more money into the Porterstown Chase, leave, leave it as it is. But um, I think the, the 150th run of the Irish Grand National should be on Easter Monday, 2021. All right, probably you've been great with your time. Um, how how are you getting through lockdown? Are you watching any box sets? Do you get any recommendations for us? Not really. I've um, been watching bits of racing in the UK or racing TV as it is now, and they're showing back on Cheltenham festivals and got a great buzz out of watching back on Grand National. So I uh, had a good old watch of the 2007 Grand National recently, so it was great. I think you might have a that future in our interior design anyway with that lovely forest green you have there on the wall and the nice little nice little compliment uh, of the curtains and all that as well. Nice work on your behalf. I'd love to claim, claim <laughs> that, but that's all my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I can see by your background, Johnny, you don't have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> By, by the end of this now, uh, who knows what's going to happen. A lot of people are going to get very bored over the, uh, the next few weeks in lockdown. <laughs> Robbie, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Johnny, as ever, your gen. Thank you for joining us as well here on Friday Night Racing. That is your lot on Friday Night Racing this week. We're with you every Friday afternoon. We stream at 3 o'clock on all of our social channels, so offtheball.com is the best place to get it, but you can also get us on youtube.com forward slash offtheball. And then every Friday evening, we're live on the radio on News Talk as well on the Off The Ball Show from 7 o'clock to nine and that was Robbie Power our guest this week a reminder of Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie or follow the Twitter account at hri racing see you next week Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball and brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie